Hello, I greet everybody. My name is Zoltan Buzadi. I work at the Central European University Business School in Budapest. I'm going to give you a webinar to which I welcome all of you about flow, the concept of leadership, and how these two things can be put together in a dynamic development process. Welcome, everybody. My area of interest uh, over the last decade has been leadership. I have moved into this area from strategic management, strategic alliances, organizational behavior and coaching areas. But I have found that leadership is such a complex and difficult area to manage that so many books have been written about that, that it is impossible for people to read this. This has been my job. I would like to present you an uh, integrated view, which is at the moment, to best of my knowledge, something which helps people to become better leaders, better managers in organizations and also in all sorts of different types of life settings. Um, in my previous uh, interest area, I have been focusing strongly on the dynamics of leadership in general. Uh, on this graph, you can see that uh, leadership um, or teams take different types of um, motivation level or performance levels as time proceeds. And then things happen at work because of you, because of others, because of external elements. And the question at that stage was, well, how should a manager react? How can this black curve be turned into a more balanced and more productive curve towards the end? in the stabilization phase. However, in recent uh, years, I have discovered that sense-making and a more balanced view about uh, leadership in modern organizations, where we spend most of the time of our life, has become a more philosophical type of question. Uh, people are asking increasingly the question, what is quality of life? What is the quality of my life? What is it that is uh, all paramount, all everywhere, uh, whilst I'm doing my routine job, I'm having the struggles, but also the joys at work? And the question uh, has been transformed in leadership, and we have found some answers for this question around quality of life in the field of psychology, positive psychology, and is linked to the questions of happiness and creativity. The great master and uh, founder of positive psychology is uh, Professor Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. He has uh, Hungarian origins. He thinks of himself as a Hungarian person also. Uh, he spent his career in America and he has founded now an ever-growing field of interest in psychology, uh, which is called positive psychology, together with his colleague Liebermann. This area is now being explored by people in brain science who are looking at um, brain waves and chemistry. But it has been used also, this idea about creativity and uh, happiness in other fields like sports and education. My role and your opportunity now is to listen to how these ideas in psychology can be applied and used in the field of management and leadership. Well, what is flow? I give you some key words, sort of a definition that we are on the same page. First of all, flow is a mental state. It is a mental state of a person, but that is a particular type of mental state, which is an active uh, performing type of mental state. So this is not the state which we are looking at when you're sleeping or when you're completely um, outside of activities. It is something which is relevant to leadership and management. This is when we're working. Uh, in this mental state, we have a particular feeling of, of energy. We're focused on, on the activities and we're fully involved and in enjoying just the activity. So we will find out why this is relevant for a leadership context and a management context in a minute. But I can tell you at this stage that uh, flow is of interest to us as leaders because it affects not only the individual, as Mihai Csikszen Mihai was researching it originally, but it turns out that uh, working in organizations and groups, this type of flow is particularly useful to create uh, creativity, it leads to happiness, and it also creates benefits for the organization and the society at large. Um, so this is why we think that the agenda of flow, flow leadership, is high on it. 
flow in uh, in a mathematical context or a graphical context for you who assume are many of engineering background has to do with performance a uh, high level of performance and that is linked to some arousal that is uh, some stimulation and um, we can say that he dis- rediscovered or he he found um, some ways of describing um, that people are performing at a higher level when the arousal is right and is correct at the optimal level. Well, uh, what are then the conditions of flow? So how do psychologists or people using the concept of flow describe what is flow uh, other than the, the definition which I just gave you? Well, the first criteria uh, which you need to be aware of if you ever want to get into flow is that you need to have a clear goal, a clear set of goals is fine as well. That means a number. There should be, there can be large goals or there can be small individual goals. For example, a small goal which Mihai described as somebody cutting fish in a New York fish bar and his goal is to cut the fish slices of uh, salmon as thin as possible. But to others, uh, a musician to write an orchestral piece, a symphony, that's a rather large goal to orchestrate all these sub-elements. These goals uh, you are looking for to achieve should not be conflicting and they should be not confusing. So they can be just uh, overall great visions or we should do this at the same time that. This is then uh, precluding people from getting into flow. The second key element of flow is that you get immediate feedback from your activity. Uh, If you're lucky, cutting fish or writing music, you can immediately hear how your ideas and your activities sound or look like. In an organizational setting, this is the role of the subordinate asking for feedback or the role of the leader to give feedback, but it can be also all the processes and outcomes and results, uh, like when you do a presentation we write a text or you have a good negotiation that it goes forward and you get feedback from external uh, factors as well. The third element which is really key is that there is a balance of uh, skills and challenges. Now what does that mean? Let me show that to you on a brand new slide we have done put together. Balance is creating a field of different mental states which range from apathy It's a black area we used here. This is an area where people are so passive. They're maybe just watching TV. Nothing happens in their life. They don't apply anything of their knowledge. And uh, if they increase um, their skill level, they they can do something. They can maybe play an instrument. They have a hobby. Um, after a while, um, they can move out of that area into different areas of mental state like relaxation and even control. Um, or the other round is uh, if the challenge increases, then worry, anxiety, arousal. We think it is important for you to emphasize that in the middle, uh, in contrast to most or almost all slides which you can find on internet, on books, there is not a fixed point in when is it that you're moving into one area to the other. There is a subjective mean in the middle. It's different for everybody. Uh, here the key point is that um, that this balancing of challenges and skills creates and leads to different mental states. It also leads, uh, if you are in flow, to a feeling of focus and concentration. This means you can't get into flow if you are not concentrating uh, on the activity. If people are interrupting you when there is something going on, multitasking precludes people from getting into flow. This is very interesting when I'm teaching. I have to tell managers to switch off their phones. That we are doing this now. We are discussing that and you should be doing the other thing. So it is very contrasting to actually the developments and trends of our life. Um, and if you are balancing this well and you're focusing on it, then you can get into this flow channel. In fact, the process happens down at the bottom left uh, side. You get into a situation, quickly you end up in your subjective mean. And if you focus on this activity, you then can actually navigate into this flow area, which is open-ended. We don't know what the maximum level of uh, flow uh, would be. So it's not a mathematical thing in the sense that it's a coordinate system of 100, 100, and on the top you are then at maximum flow. Um, It's open-ended. Now, the next uh, feature of uh, a flow condition is that when you're in that, you sort of 
uh, your attention is moving away from where you really are. You escape reality. Interestingly, uh, psychologists describe um, reality as being something unpleasant to people. We don't know where we come from. We don't know where we will be once we die. And also, also questions around why is there happiness and not happiness and sadness. So ways of escaping that is getting into art, doing a science work or being active and get into flow. So in that is also a feature of, of um, being in flow. Uh, being just about in control and challenge is also something. So it's not a th the static situation. It's a dynamic uh, process. Let me show you that on this slide. Have a look. Once you're in flow and you're just about to do something and you enjoy it and you're feeling creative, after a while that activity becomes B, position B, too easy. You start to feel bored. What do you do? You increase the level of challenge and you move uh, maybe too far with a high challenge into point D. Or uh, after a while you develop your skills again, you end up in flow again at point E. And uh, you know what will happen if you don't increase the challenge. Uh, you will get bored, so you rather increase the challenge level again. And in point F, maybe it's a bit uh, too high again, and then you wait and you work on it and develop your skills. This is how games are being developed, uh, video games, that they are, have different levels and the complexity is being increased slightly and gradually so that to keep you into fl game flow. The sense of time gets transformed when you're in flow. You should be really happy if your employees forget um, or you yourself forget time uh, when you're being told that you know it's lunch time now uh, your spouse comes in and tells you know uh, you should get to go to bed it's two o'clock in the morning already well this is a uh, signs of that you have been in flow you fo forget about time and it can be also detrimental to you yourself and your body so it's not all that positive now let me turn a little bit more to the leadership aspects because that's uh, the title of our discussion now and our focus. Um, look at these two poor uh, creatures walking around, uh, being depressed. It's always sit, stay, heal, never think, innovate, be yourself. What would the owner or the leader of this uh, creatures need to do differently to actually exploit these guys uh, full creativity well this is the question we have here at the core of it uh, well it's not only because of these two creatures as such or uh, because of this um, funny picture it is actually a, a question whether you can exploit this uh, positive benefits of getting people into flow because if you exploit the satisfaction of employees it has advantages for the individual they will spend uh, their life at an activity which is sensible to them and it also creates to their individual happiness so it takes a different approach to your subordinates which you also want of yourself that you're not just being exploited for your physical skills but also that it makes sense for you individually we think that people, uh, companies which create flow at work can also help subordinates in creating better organizations because they're more attractive and they are more have le better retention. Also, these workplaces are um, have more spontaneity. Uh, new out outcomes and solutions can emerge from this positive environment. Uh, this then can be moved from the individual to the group level, so the different departments and the teams cooperate better within, between each other. And broadly, we can say that the organizational performance uh, will be increased. Now, this cannot be achieved with uh, what I would call flower power or flower flow. It's not painting the walls yellow and putting nice flowers onto the table and um, get massage at the office. I think it has to be far more scientific and grounded than that. Fortunately, Mihai Chiks and Mihai did that partly for us already. He interviewed leading politicians, but mostly businessmen and uh, social players, and how did they create organizations in which flow was actually paramount and they had better performance. Well, uh, they clearly say that the best way to manage people is to create an environment in which they can enjoy the work. The environment um, can help people to create this individual flow. So 
the focus on these organizations was what we would call flow-based management or flow-centered management. First step is to look at your individual skills. What are the skills you have as a leader or as a manager which can promote flow? Well, we actually know that. Uh, that's the good news. So here comes uh, a core element. Out of the many leadership skills which there exist, three, four are critical for leading people into flow. I told you the first one is strategic thinking, we could call it. It's to set a target to know what you are actually supposed to do. The second one was feedback. Giving feedback and asking for feedback is the second skill. The third and the fourth one are strongly related. It's balancing skills and applying personal strength. Is to be aware of this uh, two by two dimensions of skills and challenges. Who's good at what and give that person then the activity. And if the person is doing an activity which they're not good, read balance and give them different type of activities instead. Now, for you as leaders and managers in organizations, uh, you can also think about the challenge level slightly more complicatedly. So we are talking now about leadership challenges at work, um, the challenges you want to accept. Well, which ones should you accept, which ones you should not accept? Because, you know, if the challenge is too high, you get worried or you get actually even blocked. Um, if the challenge is too low, you get bored. So one way of thinking about uh, challenges is to structure it. I will show you three different approaches. The first one is uh, take a hierarchical view uh, within an organization. Which level are you at? What are the challenges you have mastered so far? What are the challenges you are currently looking for and uh, managing and being challenged with? And what are the challenges which are ahead of you? Which one you should be preparing for the future but don't take on at this stage? Clarify with your boss that this is not your level, this challenge is too big because otherwise you will not get into flow. The next one is a dynamic approach. Um, you can think of your challenges evolving over time in your team, in your process, or um, in your project, but also uh, it evolves as you are within a company. Now the third approach is uh, also uh, sort of um, a little bit sociological. Uh, it's what professional role do you assume? Think of manager leaders, uh, they're overlapping strongly, but those roles are clearly different from an entrepreneur. An individual entrepreneur faces very different problems than a business continuity manager, an administrator, or a professional expert. Mm. So I leave this quickly open to you to think where do you belong, what are the challenges you should be assuming in order to be able to get into flow, uh, what are your current challenges is one question and can you think of future challenges you will be looking for but not now not yet because you will not get into flow if they're too premature yet i hope that uh, this brief outline of the relevance of flow and leadership somehow helps you to clarify some of your ideas it's a long journey though if you are uh, engaging on this journey, you can clarify your ideas also by reading our book. It's called Missing Link Discovered. We have presented it last fall uh, with the co-authorship of Mihai Chiksen Mihai, my colleagues at the university and a company which is developing a simulation game around flow-based leadership, alias, and um, you can read that. Otherwise, you will hear now uh, another webinar I personally will be on standby and I will be happy to answer any question which comes along based on what I just told you. Thank you very much for your interest. I hope this will be interesting to you, not intellectually only, but also for your career and your future leadership. Good morning, everybody. I am Ahilas Georgiou. I am the Technical Services Team Leader in Hungary. And also I work for uh, CU Business School as a program director for the MSc in Business Analytics program. In the following few minutes, I would like to talk about the social collaboration within enterprise organizations and the way how this is transforming the leadership styles. It is very much obvious that technology evolution during the last decade has drastically changed the world. Today, there is no business that does not depend on the technologies. Data has become the main driving force and all surrounding technologies like cloud computing, mobile, social and Internet of Things have reached their plateau of maturity. 
The synergy of the emerging technologies is moving everything towards the cognitive era. The impact of this change is boosting the business environment in every industry. The weakest link of all is not the technology, but the humans who are using them. The technology evolution is now transforming not only the business, but also the way how people work. As Laszlo Meru, the Hungarian research psychologist and a popular science author th says, we are reshaping ourselves to homo informaticus. We are sacrificing the individual in order to become more effective in teamwork and collaboration. We build teams mixing different expertise into something that makes a team more efficient than the individual separately. We excel in information gathering and processing. We are much better in pattern recognition, even we can recall situations from which we can immediately apply something that worked well earlier and drop something that another that didn't work. We are becoming problem-solving engines. When we resolve one problem, we instantly look for the next one. We feel uncomfortable when we do not have problems to solve. Up to a point where we even invent new ones by solving problems that nobody asks us to solve. On the other side, we are sacrificing the individual performance and our personal knowledge is decreasing. The conceptual and critical thinking is continuously blurring. And I'm not talking about criticizing something, we are mastering that. The original innovative ideas are not representing the work of individuals rather than the result of a teamwork. There is a big noise about how companies are trying to get people more engaged in their internal social communication. We are now using social collaboration platforms for every type of engagement. We communicate online with our customers, partners, or even with our colleagues who might be located in a different country. Young people are populating our workplaces. For them, this is not something that they need to learn, but this is a part of their expectations. In most of the cases, the leaders are those who do not even have a Facebook account, and they are the ones that need to drive their online co communication. But how most of the companies are trying to get people start using social collaboration? This is a good question, but the answer is very simple, by forcing them. Can social collaboration be measured? Can social communication be structured and driven by rules? Definitely not. Companies can measure employees' online collaboration activities, but unfortunately we can only measure the quantitative factor of the social interaction, neglecting totally the qualitative part. We are sacrificing quality for quantity to structure the unstructurable. We can measure the number of posts, the number of likes or reflections, but measuring the impact and the value of them is very difficult, almost impossible. We can even monitor the sentiment of a post, but that doesn't give us a real knowledge. A few months ago, I had the opportunity to discuss this topic with more than 30 executive MBA students in one of our classes. Most of them confirmed that they are facing similar challenges within their organizations. We spent a few hours discussing the topic, and we could define three types of social leadership styles. Let me give you insights what are those. The first type is the socially passive leaders. Many of them are still not using social communication at all. They are afraid of new communication ways. They are not yet convinced that this is something useful and sometimes they even put their heads in the sand. This doesn't mean that these leaders are not good leaders. It is better not to pretend something if a person is not comfortable doing it. Another style is the so-called socially active leader. These are the leaders who are pushing out the message and communicate re regularly, even if they do not have something to share. They do this because their management have told them to do it. I'm sure you all have received emails saying that, read my blog, I wrote something exciting, but what? Give us at least a teaser and let us decide if you want to read it. This way, we are forcing people to click and then we even say that, yes, yeah, see, we people have started using social communication. Overall, this style can even be worse than the socially passive leaders, because in most of the cases, the communication is only one directional. The third style of leadership is the socially interactive leaders. These leaders are the ones who spend more time on listening to social channels and react when needed by collaborating on e an equal level with their followers. They only talk when they really have something to share and immediately react when there is something to be done. 
Let me give you an example which was shared by one of the students in the class. There was an Australian leader who had approved a new regulation which made huge noise within the company. And when he read the feedback from the employees, he immediately withdrawn the new rule. This was a brave step, but shows a good motion of agility. So these are the three types of social leadership styles we could observe during the class. Let us now talk about how can we boost social collaboration within the enterprise. First of all, the most obvious answer is let people do it on their own way. Give them good and fancy tools and then we start using them. We should not put rules and regulations around it. If a manager, for example, doesn't feel comfortable using a social communication, let him or her use the method he, she wants. We cannot all be transformed into homo informaticus, and we definitely should not eliminate the traditional way of communication just because some statistics says that this is the new future of the business. Social communication needs to be engaging. Most of the ongoing communications at every company are one directional. So the only reaction they can bring uh, is that people start liking it. Instead of st stating things, it would be much efficient if we, if we raise questions and concerns, or if we just simply ask people about their opinion and ideas. This way, we can initiate valuable bidirectional communication. Social collaboration should ensure equality among the people, so even if an organization is not flat by nature, on social level, we should not have any hierarchies. As the network is self-regulating, there should not be any control on social communication. There is a general rule that that network dynamics cannot be forced top down. We cannot intervene by making rules and regulations. Facebook would have never become so successful that way. The network generates its own unwritten rules being accepted by the community. We need to moderate the communication though, but that's the maximum we can do. Last but not least, social communication should be fun. Most of the young employees are coming from Generation Y and are mostly interested in having fun. When the fun factor increases, people are motivated to share and contribute. But most importantly from all, we need to take the stretch of must doing something from the table and let people want to do something. Thank you very much for attending this session.